Hello and good morning friends welcome to the CEC Educet live lecture dear friends uh, with our ongoing series on copyright and trademarks uh, we have conducted numerous sessions uh, today in this uh, lecture we would be discussing on grounds for refusal of uh, trademark registration and for this discussion we have once again with us within our studios Mr Ashwini Sewal Mr Ashwini Sewal is um, assistant professor in um, IP laws and data uh, security and uh, he is employed uh, with the Uh, Delhi University in uh, Faculty of Law. Let's welcome our uh, guest, Mr. Ashwini Sewal, and let's try to understand more about uh, grounds for refusal of trademark registration. So, without wasting any time, I would like to welcome our guest, Mr. Ashwini Sewal. Mr. Sewal, welcome to the Educet Lecture. Thank you, Gitika. Welcome, viewers. Well, uh, see, in our previous discourses, viewers, I have discussed uh, the meaning of the trademark, the uh different uh, facets of the trademark or indications which can be registered by the trademark registrar well the point is uh, the thing that i am going to cover today is very important and very crucial from the point of view of getting the trademark registered once uh, we start using a mark or an indication with the goods or services in our course of trade we can claim a trademark registration though the fact of the matter is there is no requirement of trademark registration at all because the trademark uh, registration comes automatically or you can say that one can uh, get the trademark uh, protection without getting the registration though though the trademark does not get registered automatically one has to apply proactively for getting it registered but the kind of protections that are provided or or uh, the kind of uh, you know benefits one gets because of the trademark protection these benefits these protections come automatically with the use of the trademark or maybe with the proposal to use the trademark when person applies for getting it registered when we talk about the grounds for refusal of registration viewers this is the stage where uh, the trademark board examines the trademark application filed by the applicant for obtaining the trademark registration on his respective goods or services with the the trademark respectively at this at this juncture it becomes a uh, very crucial uh, for the applicant as well as for the trademark board the trademark examiner to understand all the grounds all the prohibitions as set under the trademark act 1999 as stipulated under the trademark act 1999 those prohibitions and grounds are very crucial to understand from the point of view of applicant as well because when he applies he or she should keep in mind that his trademark or the proposed uh, mark with which he is seeking an application or filing an application for must not get hit by any of the disqualifications you can call or by any of the prohibitions grounds for refusal of registration given under the trademark act 1999 and uh, when it comes to the trademark law the trademark act 1999 friends there are two provisions under the trademark act 1999 section 9 and section 11 covers and encompasses prohibitions for uh, trademark refusal or say grounds for refusal of registration of the trademark we have to discuss all the grounds for refusal of registration given under section 9 and 11 under the trademark act 1999 so for that matter our uh, primary purpose in today's delivery in today's discourse would be to threadbarely analyze the language of section 9 as well as of section 11 when we talk about the language of section 9 friends we see that section 9 is very widely and exhaustively worded this section in its ambit and sweep prohibits so many kinds of marks or indications which cannot be given a trademark protection because of the fact and reason that uh, on some or the other premise they are excluded to be given a trademark registration some exclusions or some prohibitions are based on the public policy some exclusions on some prohibitions or ground for refusal are based on the economic policy so that is how we have to see as to what all is excluded from the purview of registrability in the trademark law by purview of section 9 and 11 or by by reading like language of section 9 and 11 and then understand with the help of certain case studies in indian context or some 
case studies of the foreign jurisdiction where we see the real application of the law, where we see the real application of the grounds for the refusal of registration. And when we see those real application for the grounds of refusal of registration, we find that there are several marks or indications either in use or proposed to be used by the trademark applicant were, I, were you know either uh, negated by the trademark board to be given a trademark registration or sometimes upheld to be given a trademark protection or found cogent or you can say found adequate to be given a trademark protection but it is only possible when one understands the intricacies and the nuances of section 9 the grounds of refusal given under section 9 as well as the nuances and intricacies given under section 11 in its provisions. Well friends, when uh, it comes to the grounds for refusal, the very first provision that is section 9 covers absolute grounds for refusal of registration. These are the absolute grounds and when it talks, when, when, when we talk about the absolute grounds for refusal of registration, the very first ground that I am going to take up with a case study which, which to my understanding is very interesting a case study that prohibits any kind of a trademark which is devoid of distinctive character. It prohibits any kind of a trademark which is devoid of distinctive character. So what becomes incumbent for all of us here to understand what is the meaning of distinctive character as given under the definitional clause as well as reiterated here under section 91A in the later part of 91A distinctive character means something which is not capable of distinguishing the goods or services of one person from those of another person. So friends, this is a very wide prohibition, very wide ground available at the disposal of the trademark board while refusing the trademark registration to the applicant on his or her applied or proposed trademark. Why do I call it a wide prohibition and a wide ground for refusal of registration friends? As you see that it says something which becomes incapable or something which does not show the capability to distinguish. And when we talk about the word capability to distinguish, this capability to distinguish friends means uh, the present capability of the trademark as well the future capability of the trademark to be shown and proved by the person concerned using the trademark. So one if applies any trademark on his goods, if it does not have any present capability to distinguish or say any future promise of distinguishing the goods, in that case his trademark or his mark or an indication used by him shall be called a trademark which is devoid of distinctive character and that would get hit or negated by section 91A and shall not be registered. Well friends, this uh, requirement of capability to distinguish is a qualification inserted here which is uh, earlier we have seen the same qualification in the definition of the word trademark defined under 21ZB where it reads that a trademark means a mark capable of distinguishing the goods or services of one person from those of another. One point that I would like to discuss here friends and would like to put across for your information that this qualification in the form of capability to distinguish is a new insertion with the 1999 act. Prior to that we had a 1958 trade and merchandise marked act operative in India and in that act the use of this qualification was differently connoted or construed. It was adaptability to distinguish instead of capability to distinguish and there lies a distinction between these two words between the capability to distinguish and adaptability to distinguish. In the former, I mean in the case of capability to distinguish friends, the capability which is there in the trademark or in the mark or indication in the present context is to be seen or as well as any future capability of the trademark to distinguish the goods or services should also be seen. I mean present and future potentiality of the trademark if exists then that trademark is found fair enough to be called a well adequate or say qualified trademark falling under the definition of capability to distinguish. But if it does not show the present or the future potentiality then that trademark misses 
or or does not or say lack the capability to distinguish well friends when we analyze this uh, qualification a new insertion with the 1999 act i find that this insertion or this this qualification this new qualification capability to distinguish is of a lower threshold vis a vis to the earlier qualification which was adaptability to distinguish adaptability to distinguish implies some sort of adaptation of the trademark to be shown or its uh, possibility probability of adapted to distinguish which used to be of very high threshold and generally not found in mark or indications because there was no question of future potentiality to be seen in the case of adaptability to distinguish but nowadays with this new qualification where we see only the capability to distinguish we see vis a vis to the adaptability to distinguish that the later requirement the new requirement is of low threshold is of low yardstick and a mark or an indication proposed to be used by applicant may qualify for it if it is devoid of sorry if it is having a distinctive character or a promise to be distinctive in nature at the later course of time well friends coming to the next next ground for the prohibition or say discussing about the ground for refusal of registration of the trademark we have another clause under section 9 1 itself that is clause b of section 9 1 it reads as highlighted by me that a trademark which consists exclusively of marks or indications trademarks which consist exclusively of marks or indications may serve in trade to designate the kind quality quantity intended purpose values geographical origin or the time of production of the goods or rendering of service or other characteristics of the goods or service well friends i have uh, bifurcated it threadbarely for your uh, convenience i am coming straight away to that this section 91b involves eight prohibitions in it 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 encompasses eight prohibitions explicitly 91b says and begins with the sentence that a trademark which consists exclusively of marks if any trademark consists exclusively any kind of a mark or an indication which may serve in trade the kind of the goods which may serve in trade the quality of the goods which may serve in trade the quantity of the goods which may serve in trade the intended purpose of the goods which may serve in the trade the value geographical origin or time of production of the goods or rendering of the service or which may serve in the trade other characteristics of the goods or services well friends what we understand by all these kinds of uh, uh, prohibitions or grounds uh, which are eight in number under section 9 1b we can in nutshell say that these are all descriptive and laudatory marks or indications why i have used the word descriptive and laudatory just to inform you that under the trademarks act 1958 the words uh, used uh, in the corresponding clause were only descriptive and laudatory that act from its purview did not prohibit in such a exhaustive manner it did not cover all these kinds in such a explicit and exhaustive manner with the 1999 act we have got description of descriptive and laudatory words i mean we have got something in concrete which are prohibited to be given a trademark protection instead of using wider uh, uh, prohibition in the form of descriptive and laudatory the legislature so thought to clear by mentioning some of the prohibitory things or marks prohibitory indications to be given a trademark registration by purview of section 91b wherein it is categorically mentioned that a trademark which consists exclusively anything which may serve in trade to designate this and that i mean the following eight things if a trademark used in the course of trade designates the kind of goods designates the quality of the goods the quantity of the goods intended purpose of the goods well friends i have certain examples to make you understand suppose uh, let us take out of all these prohibitions let us come straight away to the prohibition number 7 written here 
the time of production of the goods or or say rendering of the service suppose i do have a dairy business and uh, as all of us understand and know that milk products dairy products are to be consumed on a daily basis on a day to day basis we always uh, buy it or purchase milk for our consumption on the day to day basis what if somebody tries to use the word day to day as a trademark i am repeating it for your convenience friends what if somebody tries to register a trademark which is day to day in this context will he be getting the trademark registration well friends applying these uh, eight prohibitions given under section 91b especially prohibition number 7 here don't you think that day to day as a trademark will get hit by the prohibition number 7 because it tells about the production rendering of the time production or rendering of the services it tells us that these goods are to be served on the daily basis on the day to day basis so something which everyone is allowed to use and appropriate should not be monopolized by one person and on this exclusion on this premise of exclusion the legislature has has put this kind of a prohibition with the premise that uh, such words or such such marks or indications are to be used by everyone are to be chosen by everyone for their convenience and one individual or one entity should not be given a monopoly on these kinds of words which either designate the kind which either designate the quality quantity intended purpose values geographical origin or rest of the things well friends let us take up example of prohibition number 6 which is geographical origin here when it comes to geographical origin friends we see that the word origin is used and geographical origin is different from geographical word geographical word and geographical origin are two different things all together so what is prohibited as per section 91b is the use of geographical origin as a trademark exclusively geographical word is still allowed to be used what i am saying friends it is very important i'll i'll explain it later but just keep in in mind that as per the reading of section 91b geographical origin is different from geographical word and what is restricted to be given a trademark protection under section 91b is geographical origin is is exclusive use of mark or an indication which may serve in trade use of a geographical origin but a geographical word is allowed to be used why i am emphasizing so much on this this uh, analogy well friends if you compare this act of 1999 with uh, the 1958 act you will find that jo- even the geographical words were prohibited to be given the trademark registration so with the commencement of the 1999 act geographical words can be given geographical words can be given a trademark protection because only those indications or marks are restricted to be given a trademark protection which may serve in the course of trade to designate the geographical origin but again we have another prohibition in the form of 91a which says and which 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 kind of puts a very wide prohibition which requires a trademark to be distinctive with the goods in 91a you see it is written that something which is devoid of distinctive character cannot be shall, shall not be registered so it would depend whether that trademark which is a geographical word is devoid of distinctive character or not if it is devoid of distinctive character and which to my understanding will always be devoid of distinctive character as happened in many english cases for example in the yorkshire and liverpool cases both the names are geographical words and both were not allowed to be given a trademark protection because of the fact that both the words though had 100% uh, you know kind of uh, distinctive uh, character in themselves with those goods or services but the court uh, refused to register them on two grounds that they these are geographical words first of all 
and uh, in any case they will never be able in any case they will never be able to show the distinctiveness to show the distinctive character of a trademark as requisite under the trademark act in indian context it is the trademark act 1999 in english context their trademark act found or as per their trademark act it was found that uh, yorkshire and liverpool both were not allowed to be registered because in any case they will never be able to appropriate the 100% distinctiveness with the goods with the respective goods and services well friends coming back to 91b and its threadbare analysis i am uh, kind of you know very inclined to tell you that these eight prohibitions given over here are still not exhaustive as per the language given here and used here there can come and fall so many things but the thing that to, is to be taken into mind and kept into the mind is that the trademark mark or indication used by the person should not be descriptive and laudatory if it is descriptive and laudatory then in that case the trademark shall not be registered as per 91b well friends coming to 91c and its threadbare analysis 91c friends in its purview puts two more prohibitions so in totality under 91 we have got 10 explicitly and categorically written prohibitions apart from them under 91a a very wide prohibition in the form of devoid of distinctive nature or devoid of distinctive character 91c has got two prohibitions the 91c says and reads a trademark shall not be registered which has become customary in the current language or it further reads and puts one more prohibition which reads a trademark which is an established practice of a trade or which has become a bona fide and established practice of a trade shall not be registered so friends these two prohibitions are required to be elaborated and discussed the very first prohibition which reads something which have become customary in the current language for that i have a case law with me to discuss and decipher it but for a superficial understanding i would like to explain it uh, friends anything which have become customary in the current language say world uh, rasoi has become customary in the current language it should not be given a trademark protection world janta has become customary in the current language should not be given a trademark protection on any kinds of goods or services so there can be so many words so and so forth which have become customary in the current language i've gave you an example in my previous discourse of of something which have become customary in the current language that can also be taken to understand it well friends when it comes to the second prohibition here it is uh, our prohibition which reads that something which have become bona fide and established practice of a trade should not be registered shall not be registered so there are few practices of a trade which have become bona fide and established practices of a trade they are not to be registered for that i have a very beautiful example you see word grand is generally used by hospitality and hotel industry they use the word grand so this word grand as such cannot be given a trademark registration in the form of a trademark registration to one individual or to an entity because this word grand has become established practice of a trade in the hotel industry in the hospitality sector and that is why it should not be given a trademark protection shall not be given a trademark protection because it would get hit it would get hit and negated by 91c of trademark act 1999 similarly we have some more examples to be taken here i gave you an example of makrana marbles which which has become a established practice of a trade makrana as such cannot be appropriated by one individual or an entity as a trademark because it is a bona fide and established practice of a trade in the case of marble trade similarly we saw an example of grand word so we can use another example the word gel as such in the in the case of uh, medicines and uh, cosmetics or sometimes in the case of drugs cannot be given a trademark protection to one individual one one entity or an individual cannot appropriate and own as a trademark the word gel reason being that gel word 
has become established practice of a trade and are in use bona fide by all the uh, users of uh, that word gel in that industry. That is why it is not to be given a trademark protection, it cannot be given a trademark protection. Well friends, we have uh, after 9.1c, we have one proviso attached to section 9.1 and the proviso attached to section 9.1 overholds the entire discourse uh, stated by me here. Why do I say so? Because the proviso attached reads that everything written over here under section 9 1 and its language will be of no use. In a sense it says will be of no use if the trademark concern has acquired distinctive character. Well friends I forgot to discuss and tell you that when we talk about distinctive character of a trademark, the distinctive character of a trademark can be seen from two perspectives or, uh, or there can be two components of a distinctive character of a trademark. One where it is having inherent distinctiveness. Sometimes we use some fanciful words, arbitrary words, coined words. You see, those coined invented in arbitrary fanciful words are inherently distinctive. Usually they remain inherently distinctive. Sometimes you know this situation may be, may be altogether different but usually we find that all the fanciful and arbitrary words are inherently distinctive in nature. On the other hand we have another component where we find that there are some words which lack inherent distinctiveness still those words led with the period of time with the course of their usage and use in the industry or in the course of trade become distinctive with the respective goods, acquires distinctiveness with the nature of the goods. So see there is case of acquired distinctiveness in the later component and in the case of former component there is a case of inherent distinctiveness. Well friends the proviso attached to section 9.1 is a proviso talking about acquired distinctiveness in a good or in the goods. What happens in the case of acquired distinctiveness? Any trademark used by a person lacking any inherent distinctiveness in the beginning may acquire a distinctiveness with the period of time with the usage it may be capable of distinguishing itself later on, then it remains a appropriate, it remains a you know qualified trademark to be given a registered and the trademark registration shall not be denied to it. What we understand and we conclude here that the proviso TESO section 9.1 negates the effect what is stated in the main language of section 9.1 if the mark or an indication used by the person shows or, or signifies acquired distinctiveness, the distinctiveness which the trademark has acquired over the period of time with the usage, the prominence it has acquired. To gauge that acquired distinctiveness, there are certain factors which I will discuss later with you. There are some grounds uh, for determining that which I will discuss later with you while I will take up the issue of well-known trademark and reputed trademark, not now. With that, we are done with the threadbare analysis of the language of section 9.1. Apart from that friends, we have 9.2 and 9.3 which also encompasses some more prohibitions. Under section 9.1, we saw that categorically there are 10 prohibitions under section 9.1b and 9.1c and under 9.1a, the wide prohibition in the form of distinctive character to be proved is mentioned. After that, we are going to discuss 9.2 and 9.2 friends is kind of posing or putting four kinds of uh, prohibitions. Those prohib prohibitions I will be discussing with you in a while.
after evaluating the threat bear, uh, threat bear language of section 9 and the prohibitions uh, put under section 9 1 specifically, I have certain case studies to be discussed in this session friend. Section 9 1 case studies are very interesting and important at this juncture to be understood by all my viewers. The very first case study that I have to discuss here is the case study of year 1955. And this case study reads, Hindustan Development Corporation Limited, Deputy Registrar of Trademarks. It is versus Deputy Registrar of Trademarks. Well, friends, in this case study, the word Rasoi as trademark for hydrogenated groundnut oil was in contention. Friends, as highlighted by, my, by me earlier and, and kind of, you know, in an example discussed by me earlier, that word Rasoi should not be given a trademark protection. But what we have to understand from this case study as to why and on what premise and ratio the word Rasoi should not be given a trademark registration or shall not be registered. Well, friends, the goods in question on which the word Rasoi is proposed to be used are hydrogenated groundnut oil. Hindustan Development Corporation, the present appellant in this case, uses or proposes to use Rasoi as a trademark for hydrogenated groundnut oil. This Hindustan Development Corporation proposed to the trademark board that they want to use Rasoi word as a trademark on their goods which are hydrogenated groundnut oil to be used in the Rasoi in the kitchen. The trademark board found that the word Rasoi has got a direct reference to the goods in question. It describes the character of the goods in question and has got a direct reference to the goods in question. So, what happened in that case law, I will discuss in nutshell to make you understand just uh, you know the ratio and the rationale applied by the court of law in this case law while deciding it. The court said that something which has got a direct reference to, to the goods or uh, services in question, some mark or an indication in this context, if it has got a direct reference to the goods or services, then that particular trademark, mark or an indication proposed to be used by the applicant shall not be registered. Reason being that there are several grounds written under section 9.1 prohibits to do so. Apart from that, the court in that case law described and, and later on, uh, you know, kind of uh, went ahead to describe that Rasoi word as such is, is a word which has become customary in the current language. This was not as such in the question, this case, whether this word is, this, this question, whether the, whether the word Rasoi is in customary language, is of a customary language or not. That kind of a question was never mooted before the court, but still the court rejecting the word Rasoi to be given a trademark protection and upholding the decision taken by the trademark board says further that the word Rasoi even though you see it has got a direct and uh, 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 kind of you know very proximate reference to the goods in question, it shall not be given a trademark registration because the word Rasoi has customary has become a customer in the current language. For that matter, the court applied, uh, you know, its analysis and found that the word Rasoi has got various meanings. In, in some states of India, the word Rasoi is used to designate cooked food. In some parts of the country, the word Rasoi describes premises where the food is cooked. In some parts of the country, the word Rasoi is used for uh, describing and signifying the utensils used for cooking. So, the word varies from reason to reason, but in most of the part of India, the word Rasoi is understood as a word which describes the, the place where the food is cooked. It is described as a place where the food is cooked and, and sometimes it is described as a, as a commodity which is used for cooking the food or utensils say raw products to be used for cooking the food. That is why the court said there is a very much likelihood or a probability of this word to be called 
a word which has become customary in the current language it can be negated on on both the fronts i mean under section 9 1 it can be negated because it lacks distinctive character with respect to or in relation to the goods which are hydrogenated ground nut oil in this case and it can be negated on another aspect that is another prohibition given under section 91c which says any trademark which has become customary in the current language shall not be registered well friends on the first parameter whether the word rasoi is distinctive in character the court said that as it is very close and and you know having a direct reference to the goods it cannot or it do not seem it does not seem to be a distinctive word in relation to the goods which are hydrogenated ground nut oil in this case so something which which is devoid of distinctive character which which is very direct or describing the character directly shall not be registered only those things or marks or indication shall be registered which does not have a direct and straight reference to the quality straight reference to the kinds of goods for which that trademark is proposed to be used only those goods are to be or only those marks or indications are to be registered which have only remote reference or or no reference at all in relation to the goods because only those marks which have remote or no reference to the goods or to the character of the goods will be able to call possessing distinctive character on the other hand on the contrary those marks or those indications which have a direct reference to the character or quality of the goods shall always be devoid of distinctive character in relation to those goods so when it comes to distinctiveness and identifying the distinctive character this case study hindustan development corporation limited versus deputy registrar of trademarks is of much use for all my viewers as this is a very old case study of year 1955 i have specifically picked up this case study because this is a case study of the year 1955 when the trademark act 1950 1940 was operative even the 1958 58 act did not come into the inception or did not commence at all why did i pick it because the principle to describe distinctive character remains same even today except the only one distinction between the yardstick of distinctive character being changed where the new act puts the qualification in the form of capability to distinguish and the prior act uses the word adaptability to distinguish wherein wherein only the difference or distinction of yardstick distinction of threshold the new act puts a very low threshold and the prior act used to be having a very high threshold well friends another case study that is on section 91 itself uh, where the word shimla was written prominently and a label was proposed to be used where the word shimla was written probability in panels used as wrapper of cigarettes this case law imperial tobacco company of india versus registrar of trademarks is of year 1977 and the court which decided this case law is calcutta high court well friends first of all to understand this case study we need to understand what was the kind of a mark to be registered or proposed to be registered it was a label and the entire label uses the word shimla in its panels prominently written apart from the get up of the label the device used in the label so it was a kind of you know label which was to be registered and proposed to be registered as a trademark in this case law imperial tobacco company this company imperial tobacco company which is an appellant in this case law they started selling cigarettes having a wrapper wherein the label showing or bearing snow clad hills with the word shimla prominently written was in the market used by them it got challenged before the trademark board that this kind of a word shimla or say label involving the word shimla should not be given a trademark registration shall not be registered as per section 9 and its prohibitions 
well friends what we are going to discuss and see as to what are the prohibitions that will get invoked while using the word shimla there can be two three prohibitions of section 91 which can get invoked while using the word shimla on a cigarette or on cigarette as goods what is important to be seen here is that it was a label to be used not only the word shimla alone to be used the entire label was in question where the word shimla was written prominently and the name of the company imperial tobacco company was inscribed in a very blurred sense or in a very small manner not prominently unlike the word shimla which was used prominently the question that came into the consideration before the court of law can this kind of a label be registered well one more important fact which i forgot to mention that in this label snow clad hills were used as a device in the background and in the panels of that label word shimla was prominently written so the word shimla as such friends is a name of geographical place in india and that entire panel bearing a device of snow clad hills signifies that shimla which is a hill station in india is a place from where these goods are originating from it kind of projects the label and the parents of the label to the unwary consumer or to the consumer of not that much of intelligence projects as if these cigarettes are manufactured in shimla where you see the tobacco is grown in those hills in those snow clad hills where the fact of the matter is that no such tobacco is grown in that shimla region shimla region does not grow tobacco does not as such have any tobacco industry over there but what is the impression going in into the minds of the consumers after having a parents of the label which involves or bears a snow clad hill in the background and the word shimla written as if those cigarettes are coming and originating from shimla region which is kind of leading to deception into the mind of the consumer leading to the misleading to the consumer sorry well friends the law that was in the consideration in this case was section 9 can this kind of a label bearing snow clad hills and shimla were written prominently be rejected well the court found undoubtedly it can be rejected under section 91 especially under section 91b where it reads that any trademark or an indication which consists exclusively a geographical place which consists exclusively in the course of trade and which may serve to designate the geographical place is not the word shimla designating a geographical place yes it does taking reference from yorkshire and liverpool case friends where the english courts has put very high threshold and says that the re- words or say geographical words names of geographical places can never become distinctive in nature can never be called possessing distinctive character because of the fact that uh, you see these words or these geographical names or geographical words are to be appropriated by everyone are to be used by everyone are to be chosen by everyone to be left open to be used by everyone no one entity no one specific individual should be given a monopoly over these geographical names otherwise it would be the situation or a scenario where all the celebrated names of cities all the prominent names of cities and districts will get acquired will get uh, monopolized by few handful of people and others if want to use it in their course of trade say any person from from shimla if would like to use word shimla with his or her goods he shall not be able to use it if the imperial tobacco company owns it as a trademark so this practice seems to be malafide in 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 an is an attempt to appropriate uh, name of a geographical place which get hit straight away by the prohibitions put under section 91 especially section 91b well friends let us take another case study 
which was just discussed uh, by me as an example while discussing or while analyzing the language of section 91 in this case study we find that the word janta for torches was in contention and the name of the case study is jeep flashlight industries versus registrar of trademarks 1972 delhi high court the word janta well friends as you all know i believe that indian audi audience understands that the word janta signifies people signifies populous populace it has got kind of you know prominence uh, or uh, kind of you know it is pervasive in all parts of india that the word janta is used to signify populace is used to signify people of the nation literally meaning of janta is this what happened in this case low friends the appellant g flashlight started manufacturing torches and they are very good in manufacturing torches at that point of a time they were a very prominent player in the market for manufacturing torches so they came up with a new torch with the name janta and their uh, uh, you know explanation as to why they picked the word janta for those torches seems little cogent wherein they stated that these torches are are of very good quality are to be used by people of the nation and they are available at a very cheaper price so janta word was used by them to signify that these torches are meant for whole of the nation these torches are meant for the people at large i mean as they are available at a cheaper price so everyone can afford to buy those goods that is why they put the word janta as a trademark and applied for obtaining the registration with the trademark janta on those torches what the court stated and said and and you know decided in this case the court said that uh, the word janta should not be allowed to be used as a trademark on the torches and the reason supplied by the court while deciding so seems uh, very clear and apparent that the word janta has become customary in the current language section 91c says that the trademark which has become customary in the current language shall not be registered so the prohibition given under section 91c gets invoked straight away to deny or to refuse the registration on the word janta for torches well friends i believe these case studies are sufficient to make you understand uh, the section 91 and its implications we will take some more case studies some recent case studies later on in later discourses let us jump to the language of section 92 there is another prohibition or some more prohibitions are covered under section 92 section 92 friends reads that a mark shall not be registered as a trademark if it is of such nature as to deceive the public or cause confusion well friends as nothing has been categorically written as to what would deceive and what would cause confusion under section 92a what we infer from its language and from this language is aptly clear to a legal mind and a person of a legal mind this language makes this prohibition very wide in its sweep and gamut in its ambit see something which is deceiving or some some something which has a nature to cause confusion shall not be registered and there can be anything under that umbrella which may lead to deception or may cause confusion and that is why section 92 is called very widely worded the entire section 9 on the one hand and this section 92a on the other can be seen as uh, what two ends of these in the form of a two ends of a spectrum 92a is a very wide uh, scope prohibition and a prohibition of having very wide implication or scope 
anything can be denied and there lies a scope of discretion as well when the, there comes a question of application of section 9 to A. Well friends, let us take some examples. See whatever we have understood from section 9 1, especially 9 1 A which reads that anything which is devoid of distinctive character shall not be registered will also fall under 9 2 A will be one of the integer of 9 to A because anything which is lacking a distinctive character may lead to deception, may lead to confusion. Similarly, whatever we read under 9 to C, something which sorry 9 to B, something which designates the kind, quality, quantity, use of a descriptive or laudatory word with the goods may also lead to deception or confusion. Similarly, the case of 9 1 C. So, all the things that we studied under 9 1 and that we are going to study under 9 1 3, sorry, 9 1 and under 9 3 will automatically fall under 9 2 A because 9 2 A is widely worded. It says that anything which causes deception into the mind of the public with respect to the goods or services on particular, on those particular goods or services that trademark has been affixed. If my trademark gives a scope of deception, scope of confusion, then it would get hit by 9 to A, it shall not be registered. If any trademark being deceptively similar, being confusingly similar, gives a scope of deception or confusion, shall not be registered as per section 9 to A. If the trademark has got a phonetic similarity, if a trademark has been, has got a visual similarity for trademark has got some sort of you know similarity which is leading to deception or confusion shall not be registered. Section 9 to covers so many things and discretion and the scope of discretion of the trademark board lies here. It is pertinent to note that discretion applies in determining what is causing deception, what is leading to confusion. But this discretion friends is not an unguided discretion, it is a guided discretion and it is guided by some judicial dictas and precedents. We will have to see some precedents decided by the court, some judicial interpretations made by the court in the prior decisions, in the former decisions to apply that discretion. I mean the trademark board cannot outrightly reject any trademark by explaining that this trademark is leading to deception or confusion unless he gives some reasons in writing, in deciding so, in determining so. Well friends, another uh, prohibition covered under section 9.2 is that, that if any trademark contains or comprises any matter likely to hurt the religious susceptibilities of any class or section of citizens of India, it shall not be registered. Well friends, this is very interesting to, to see that uh, anything which, which results into or which comprises any matter likely to hurt the religious susceptibility of any class or section of the citizens of India shall not be registered. What can hurt the religious susceptibilities? What can hurt the, you know, kind of uh, susceptibilities or tolerance of the people? citizens of the country, it can be anything. For example, a trademark indicating some goods wherein a pictorial representation of or a mutilated pictorial representation of god and goddess is used, mutilated pictorial representation or say any trademark where some religious lines are used but in a mutilated sense. So anything that hurt the religious susceptibilities, there can be many examples, I mean use of uh, some religious connotations with some unacceptable goods or services, use of sacred religious connotations with unacceptable goods or services, with some sort of services which, which are with the, which are the bad side of the society. That kind of a use of those marks or indications which are 
sacred and religious in nature and are going to hurt the religious susceptibilities of the people are not allowed to be registered shall not be registered as per section 92b similarly <coughs> and and say later on under section 92 under section 92c especially a mark shall not be registered if it comprises or contains scandalous or obscene matter any mark or an indication used on the goods or on services if giving or signifying to be obscene or if giving an idea that it, these are scandalous in nature they shall not be registered what can be obscene what can be scandalous has to be determined has to be adjudged by the authority in question i mean the trademark board in this question while analyzing the application while examining the application but they have to keep in mind that something which is scandalous or, or obscene in nature and if that kind of a thing is used as a trademark on the goods or on services then that shall not be registered as per section 92 then there comes another prohibition under section 92 which reads that the trademark shall not be registered if its use is prohibited under the emblems and names act 1950 well friends there is one prevention of improper use act 1950 <clears throat> this act prohibits the use of some national emblems some names to be used for any purpose so the trademark act 1999 reads and 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 puts a prohibition that any name or an emblem which is prohibited to be used by this act of 1950 that shall not be registered so they, we have studied that there are four prohibitions given under section 92 for our uh, disposal and for the disposal of the trademark board and to be seen by the person applying for the trademark registration out of these four written under 92 92a is one of the most important and widest one which says something which is deceiving the public or is causing confusion shall not be registered on that i have certain case studies to discuss and i believe those case studies would be very helpful to make you understand as to what would be called deceiving the public as to what would be called causing a confusion and leading to deception and confusion with the help of those case studies i'll make you understand the application and the implication of section 92a with that i rest here thank you very much friends with this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much uh, for your uh, precious uh, and uh, very, very resourceful uh, uh, session. Dear friends, we believe that uh, this session today would have benefited you. And if you have uh, any queries or any suggestion or uh, any topic which you like uh, to have uh, delivered through this uh, EduSet platform, then you can mail us at info.cc at the written ic.in. And very shortly, we are going to upload this lecture on YouTube for you for your accessibility. We would be meeting again very soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you Thank so you. very much.